Hello and welcome to this lesson for Advanced Higher Biology, which will be looking at the costs and benefits of both sexual and asexual reproduction. So there's quite a lot to get through in this one, but primarily we're looking at two main types of reproduction and their advantages and disadvantages. So you need to be able to explain what's meant by sexual reproduction and give the costs and the benefits. Explain why co-evolutionary interactions may select for se sexual reproduction. Explain what is meant by asexual reproduction and give the costs and benefits and describe the possible methods of asexual reproduction in eukaryotes, essentially vegetative cloning and parthenogenesis. And you also need to explain the conditions which will favour asexual reproduction. So to begin with a little bit of a recap in terms of the differences between sexual and asexual reproduction. You should remember from National 5 and higher that Asexual reproduction is essentially when we're looking at an organism making a clone of itself. It is copying its genetic material entirely, splitting up and turning into an entire clone of itself. Whereas sexual reproduction requires two parents, both of which are passing on half of their genetic information. Now, generally speaking, Evolution favours individuals that are able to produce the maximum number of surviving, surviving offspring using the least amount of energy. Uh, normally, the simplest way to do this would be by using asexual reproduction. And it's obvious that this method evolved long before the more complex cellular processes of needed for sexual reproduction. And there's a few benefits and a few costs to each of those. Generally speaking, the cost to asexual reproduction is that you don't get any genetic variation in the population at all. So the fact that the individuals are clones of their parents means that identical genetic variation is being passed on um, from generation to generation without any change. However, with sexual reproduction, there are two particular costs. First of all, that only 50% of the population can produce offspring. So if we're thinking about evolution favouring organisms that are able to produce a large number of offspring, the fact that only 50% of the population are able to produce offspring is a bit of a deterrent. And also the fact that only half of each parent's genome is passed on can potentially be a bit of an issue. This is referred to as the paradox of the existence of males. Essentially, the problem being is why do males exist in organisms that are reproducing sexually? If we consider those two costs, the fact that, first of all, if you can only have 50% of your population producing offspring, you are seriously reducing the number of offspring that can be produced at any one time which as a species is not a brilliant tactic for evolution. We also have to consider the fact that 50% of the genome of each parent is passed on at any one time. Now that may not seem like a particular cost, however, remember we're thinking about selection, we're thinking about our most successful organisms surviving to reproduce. So if you have a very successful female individual of the species, then the fact that her DNA, her genetic information, is being diluted by 50% by the male with which she is reproducing is a particular cost. We're reducing that successful genotype, that successful genetic variation. And as I said, this is referred to as the paradox of the existence of males. However, despite this paradox of the male, sexual reproduction has become the main strategy in virtually all complex organisms. Hypothesis is, however, bleb. However, despite the paradox of the male, sexual reproduction has become one of the main strategies in virtually all complex organisms. Hypotheses suggest that the serious disadvantages of having a male as one of your species members are outweighed by the benefits of an increase in genetic variation in the population. So this genetic variation provides the raw material required for adaptation and that gives our sexually reproducing organisms 
a better chance of survival under changing selection pressures. So essentially, the fact that males exist provides us with that variation, and that variation has allowed us to survive and adapt depending on our changing environment. Now, the Red Queen hypothesis can explain the persistence of sexual reproduction as the co-evolutionary interactions between parasites and hosts may select for sexually reproducing hosts. If you have hosts that are better able to resist and tolerate parasitism, they've got greater fitness, so this trait will increase in subsequent generations. Parasites, however, that are selected to be better able to feed and reproduce and be transmitted to new hosts. If hosts are reproducing sexually, the genetic variability in their offspring is going to reduce the chance that all of them are going to be susceptible to parasites. So, for example, some long-term lab, lab experiments have been done using a species of freshwater snail, and they've give some, given some evidence for this hypothesis. If we consider that this particular species has both asexual clones and sexual individuals, there is actually a high correlation found between the presence of the parasites and the frequency of sexual individuals within the population. So what's happening is that the increased number of parasites is causing an increased number of individuals to be produced through sexual reproduction. And as a result, we're going to have more variation. So hopefully within that variation, we'd be looking to have some offspring resistance, resistant to the parasites. Considering asexual reproduction, it can be considered quite a successful reproductive strategy as you are passing whole genomes from parent to offspring. And because of asexual reproduction, we've got just one parent able to produce two daughter cells and that can establish a colony of virtually unlimited size over time. And maintaining the genome of that parent can be quite an advantage if you're in a very narrow or stable niche or if you're recolonizing a disturbed habitat. So if you consider the fact that some particularly prokaryotic, prokaryotic organisms, which are the main ones which carry out asexual reproduction, tend to live in very narrow niches, by which we mean they are not altering the range of environments with which they're prepared to tolerate. As a result of that, they don't see much environmental variation and therefore don't really have a need to create much variation in their populations in order to adapt to that. If they don't expect much variation in their environment, there's no need for them to be adapted. However, it's not just in prokaryotes. We have a range of methods of vegetative cloning involving in flowering plants. So, for example, bulbs um, that you might see in daffodils or onions or garlic, plantlets pr present on the Mexican hat plant, and runners, which are also known as stolons, which you might see in a spider plant or a strawberry plant. These are good examples of asexual reproduction, as the parent plant is simply producing new plants to carry on the next generation and those new plants are going to be a genetically identical copy to the parent. It is also possible to see something called parthenogenesis and this is when we have reproduction from a female gamete without fertilization and this occurs mostly in lower plants and animals. Lower plants, by the way, are just any type of plant which doesn't have a vascular system. And by vascular system, we mean the transport systems like xylem and phloem. However, we're going to focus on different parthenogenesis in different animal species. So considering female Komodo dragons, first of all, they have been known to reproduce without fertilization after several years with no male contact. So it does appear that for continuation of their species, that that's how the female responds to isolation. And interestingly, the offspring produced through this process are always male. So without a male present, there's no fertilization taking place. Literally one of her eggs, one of her gametes, will essentially begin to develop into an embryo and provide reproduction in that method. Similarly, with stick insects, they can also reproduce in the absence of males. However, with one little difference to the Komodo dragon, all of their offspring that are produced are female. 
So this is quite a rare phenomenon and is more commonly found in areas with lower parasitism. So the fewer parasites you have, the more likely you are to have parthenogenesis. So it tends to include cooler climates and that's disadvantageous to parasites and also any other regions within those climates where there is low parasite density or diversity. So if you consider the Red Queen hypothesis, that would mean that in those areas, the Red Queen's race is being run a bit more slowly, if you like. Um, so there's no selection pressure on producing offspring with genetic variation, and that can allow the parthenogenesis to occur. Now, asexually re reproducing populations cannot adapt easily to changes in their environment. However, you can have mutations occurring that provide some degree of variation and enable some natural selection and evolution to occur. So organisms that reproduce principally by asexual reproduction also have mechanisms for horizontal gene transfer between individuals of the same generation, and that can increase variation. So prokaryotes bacteria and yeast, for example, are able to exchange genetic material horizontally and that results in faster evolutionary change than in organisms that would normally reproduce vertically or essentially have vertical transfer of their genes. And essentially what we're considering is the fact that it's possible for one bacteria to pass genetic information to another bacteria of the same generation without reproduction being involved. Whereas in other organisms that carry out vertical gene transfer, so parent to offspring, you would have to wait for the development of the offspring in order for them to show the benefit of that particular genetic mutation or trait. So there's been quite a lot to cover in that section. As ever, please feel free to ask any questions as we go over this in class later on.